Linda and Alexis and uh, everyone at SSF uh, for putting this together and uh, delighted to be here with you. I'm actually on vacation with my family out in the Columbia River Gorge. I wish I could show you the river, but the lighting is a little off, but uh, I'll just enjoy that view myself. I will declare I'm calling out the baseball season that may or may not be. Um, I'm going to put in my plug for the Cardinals, and I'm wearing uh, a jersey from uh, Yadier Molina, future Hall of Famer and one of the greatest catchers to ever play the game. So I'm going to talk a bit about uh, avoidance and management of rod fracture or non-union among adult deformity patients, and then we've got our, our fellows have teed up uh, several cases to kind of uh, uh, illustrate some of the points I want to make. Let's see here. I'm not seeing the arrow. Like, uh... Can you, there you go. There it is, I got it. So um, rod fracture, I think anyone that uh, does adult deformity knows uh, from their own experience that it is, it remains a very significant problem uh, and a very significant uh, complication and one of the more frequent complications and one of the more frequent causes of need for revision surgery of man among adult deformity surgery. Uh, these are several older uh, articles, uh, really before I think we started to change some of the instrumentation techniques. And I'm going to highlight those. The article I'm going to call out the most here is by Justin Smith uh, out of the ISSG database. And he was really the driver of this uh, paper. And we found it a 9 to 22% rate, 9% among all comers and 22% among patients that had undergone a pedicle subtraction osteotomy. Some of the details that that article showed were that obesity, the risk factors for uh, subsequent rod fracture include obesity, comorbidity, post-operative wound infection in the posterior operation site. Uh, revision surgeries are more prone to it. Those with three-column osteotomy, as I already called out. Back then, a uh, number of our surgeons were not using BMP. I think most of us have gone towards using BMP as the kind of the I won't call it the gold standard, certainly not the standard of care, but I think the strongest stimulant we have for fusion and among uh, complex uh, deformity cases, I think it's very important that we take make use of that. And then uh, the uh, preoperative optimization, particularly of bone quality uh, and uh, increasingly the use of thicker and more uh, and perhaps stiffer uh, rod material and rod size and rod number. Uh, one of the considerations that might make sense among deformity patients is uh, length of construct. And we actually looked at this. Uh, Alan Daniels drove this project uh, out of ISSG, uh, looking at the effect of going to the upper thoracic spine as opposed to the uh, lower lumbar spine. I don't, I don't know if you can see me pointing here, but the fracture rate among patients for thoracal lumbar versus upper thoracic was not statistically significant, although the odds ratio does favor a higher rate of non-union among the longer constructs. And whether that's because we see some in the areas of the thoracic spine, which I think is generally fairly rare, uh, or because uh, the overall length of the construct implies something about maybe the age or something else about the patient's uh, deformity, I'm not certain. But it's close to significance, but not quite significant in that study. So uh, that issue may or may not be a risk factor and probably shouldn't inform our decision making about whether to go longer or shorter with these constructs. Uh, typically, the timing of this complication is after 12 months. This is by far the biggest, um, the biggest number in, in that series. Again, this is Justin Smith and ISSG data. Uh, between 12 and 24 months or greater than 24 months. And really, I think if we're seeing rod fractures in this kind of time frame, less than three months or three to six months, we really have to question something about the materials we're using or, or the techniques we're using. That really just shouldn't happen in that sort of a time frame. And we found that it was most common, again, among around uh, pedicle subtraction osteotomies. Uh, that's most of these uh, patients, all were pedicle subtraction osteotomies. And then uh, the patients that were not pedicle subtractions, the most frequent location is down at the caudal end of the construct, not exclusively as you see here. Some of these are upper lumbar or even into the thoracic, lower thoracic spine, but most down, the greatest number down, L45 or L5S1 as a location. 
a study that we put together uh, using the ISSG data a few years ago looked at the fusion grade classification that has been used for years, um, uh, put out of Washington University, and has, I think, you know, I don't want to question the uh, utility of this and the value of this classification, uh, but, but we wanted to look at whether that was as informative as the presence of rod, rod fracture in terms of actual patient symptoms and clinical outcome. Uh, so we, we raised the concern that there really is no gold standard verification of ultimate fusion uh, despite radiographic uh, appearances. And rod fracture, you know, uh, I think most of us would agree that rod fracture typically is a proxy for true non-union. I'll show you some data a little later that rod fracture can happen even in the face of a, of a true fusion or a solid fusion. Uh, but uh, knowing the status of the fusion without visualizing rod fracture, I think, is, is really uh, difficult to, to, to assess and to really know what the meaning of that is. So our hypothesis was that rod fracture is going to be more important than radiographic fusion grade with respect to clinical outcome. And this was the ultimate uh, publication that resulted from uh, this review. And again, this was done with ISSG data. So this is a retrospective review of prospectively collected uh, adult deformity uh, uh, patients uh, treated surgically. They were consecutively uh, enrolled. Uh, and our uh, HRQOLs included the usual ODI, SF36, and SRS22. For those of you that don't recognize LSDI, that's a, a, a lumbar stiffness disability index that we developed a number of years ago at, at OHSU. Uh, trying to look at the effects of stiffness as opposed to pain on functional outcomes. And we had two separate surgeons assess the uh, fusion mass by the uh, Washington University classification, both of whom were blinded to outcome as they reviewed the radiographs. So uh, we grouped these into just two groups, the first and second group being a robust or probable or definite fusion, and then the second group uh, claiming to be a probable or definite non-union. And this is, again, not looking at rod fracture, but looking at uh, the, uh, the continuity of the fusion mass. And so that was the first group, and the second group was three and four. So rod fractures and associated revision procedures were re reported by the treating physician. This was not part of the initial database, so we collected that separately. And then uh, we, we looked at the four groups. Again, the first two based on the radiographic uh, assessment. That's the, the group one is group one and two from the uh, lanky Washu classification. Group two is group three and four from that classification. And then group three are those patients that have an obvious rad, rod fracture that didn't end up undergoing uh, revision surgery. And the fourth group are those with rod fractures that did end up undergoing revision uh, fusion surgery. And what we found was really there's almost no difference between the first two groups in terms of clinical outcomes. And really, we don't start to see differences in clinical outcomes until we visualize a rod fracture. So the utility or the importance of rod fracture seems to be much more important in terms of clinical outcome as measured by HRQOLs. Here's the Oswestry, but it was very consistent across almost everything that we measured with. So SF36, again, uh, very uh, similar uh, uh, between the, the patients without rod fractures and distinctly different among those uh, with rod fractures. Not quite reaching statistical outcome here, but in other questions, in other uh, outcome measures it did. So SF36 activity level uh, and SF36 pain level, again, very close to statistical significance. And SF36 total, sorry, SRS 22R uh, total score was also uh, very similar to this. Interestingly, when we looked at the stiffness index, and here again, similar to Oswestry, a higher number of, uh, uh, on the LSDI score indicates a higher level of disability we found that once the rod fractured, restoring motion and presumably increasing flexibility, patients were actually reporting a greater impairment due to stiffness. And that's been an issue we've kind of uh, noted in other settings that really lumbar stiffness may result more to, to low back pain uh, than real stiffness in some settings. And in this case, I think what happens is that they become painful and patients then are not using the mobility that's available to them and therefore uh, perceive it as a greater impact of stiffness. 
So in conclusion, we found that ra plain radiographic measures of fusion seemed to have limited clinical value. There really weren't much difference. There weren't big differences between those with high fusion grades and low fusion grades based on their uh, plain x-rays. Now, would that be different if we get uh, CAT scans on everyone? Perhaps. Uh, but I think most of us uh, currently, that's not a standard protocol and, and um, would require a different uh, set of uh, a different set of data, really. Uh, and then among the patients we looked at, rod fracture was a much better correlate with out outcome measures. And in fact, not all patients suffering rod fractures ultimately underwent revision surgery, at least during the timing of this uh, study. And, and I think you also saw that those patients that didn't uh, undergo revision surgery did not have as bad an outcome on their, uh, on their HRQOLs as those undergoing uh, revision fusion. So I think this informs us that we don't need to operate automatically in the face of rod fracture. It really remains about how the patient is doing. And as we've long said, we operate on patients, not on x-rays. And this is yet another example of that playing out in our, uh, in, in a multi-center, a multi-surgeon uh, uh, approach to these patients. And I, I said earlier, in some patients, we believe that there is rod fracture after what continues to look like a solid fusion. And this is a patient, again, out of the ISSG database that uh, developed a rod fracture between the second and third uh, year of their surgery. Their, this is a, a second year, a two-year outcome radiograph with an intact spine. I can't quite see it behind our uh, videos, but over here we've got uh, a long film showing a rod fracture and over here that's blown up. So a unilateral rod fracture in a patient that I think we would all agree uh, would be, we would all be delighted with uh, the fusion mass that appears here if we could get that in all of our patients. So certainly it appears to be a solid fusion uh, and the clinical impact in this case was limited. And this was not limited to this one patient, this was just a case example, but this was a series of a number of patients that appeared to have radiographically solid fusions maintained alignment uh, and high fusion grade despite the presence of a rod fracture and that ultimately did not undergo uh, refusion in the timing of the, uh, of the review. So tips and pearls in terms of rod fracture and pseudoarthrosis, I think it's key that we begin to use osteobiologic. I feel at least for open surgery that that is uh, really something I, I'm, uh, I wanna use in every patient and, and it's uh, something I'm willing to push back on my hospital it is expensive, uh, but it, I think it adds value uh, in a very substantial way. Uh, I think treating bone density pre-op with Forteo or one of the other anabolic uh, medications is, is something that most of us have adopted. And um, I'm not sure that we've proven that that's reducing rod fracture, but I believe it is reducing, uh, it, it, it increases the, uh, the mechanical uh, performance of the implants and also uh, has been shown to be a, a stimulant of fusion and therefore important to continue after uh, the surgery has been performed. I think alignment planning is key and that's been shown in a number of studies now, both in terms of outcome, but uh, in terms of the clinical benefit that patients perceive, but also uh, in terms of some of the more common complications, both in terms of proximal junctional failure or severe kyphosis or rod fracture. If we don't get the alignment and balance right, the mechanical uh, strain on the rods is, is, uh, is, is higher and their propensity to fail is going to be higher. Uh, one thing that I've uh, done regularly at L5S1, if, the, if it's a large disc, I typically am wanting an inner body fusion and I usually will do that from the front. I think if we do it as a T-lift, you're taking away a facet, maybe uh, adding to the lower level of instability. We know 5.1 is a challenging level to get to fuse. And so I think uh, adding a, a larger footprint by an A-lift there is helpful. Um, I perform inner bodies at all laminectomized levels. That's something I've done for a long time. Again, with the notion that uh, I don't want to rely on just one unilateral facet for my fusion at those levels. Uh, and uh, inner bodies at, um, I, at uh, sorry, I have also increased the rod diameter to 6.0 or 6.35. I think most of us have done that. Um, I now will use four pelvic screws in virtually every, uh, uh, every spinal deformity patient, certainly everyone with unfused segments in the lumbar spine, I'm doing that. And then a lot of us are also using more rods around um, three column osteotomies in particular, 
and uh, T lifts. And I would say I use four rods. You know, at the time I prepared this talk, in some cases it was three, but almost can, every patient for me now gets a fourth rod with a, a separate set of pelvic screws at the bottom. <clears throat> So what surgical options can we use to, in terms of pattern of instrumentation? Uh, uh, these offset connectors are part of every uh, packet uh, of every implant uh, system at this point. Dual head rods also uh, fit into this category. So uh, we're seeing manufacturers respond to the perceived need for uh, additional rods uh, with uh, innovation around the uh, the connecting mechanisms between devices, and I'll show some of this. We'll show in the in the cases after uh, the talk, uh, sort of the use of those devices and and how I like uh, to use dominoes in various settings. So a few case examples of my own, and these are actually several years old. This gentleman I operated on five years ago at least, and uh, he came in following kind of a potpourri of. Uh, spinal fusion procedures with, and actually with an a interspinous process device at the upper segment. You can see he's well out of sagittal alignment and a very degenerative disc there at the top and residual stenosis. Uh, so uh, this was an early example of quad rods around a PSO for me. Now I am doing these uh, almost exclusively using satellite rods as opposed to outrigger rods. And I think the definition, as I understand it, is outrigger rods are attached to the main construct. Uh, satellite rods are detached from the main construct. And I've said, uh, and I think we still need to establish the biomechanics, but I think intuitively what we're doing, if we do that around a PSO and we have a short rod of only a level above, level below, with perhaps a T-lift at the level of the osteotomy, we are changing that construct from something in the middle of a long construct to essentially a one or two level T lift. And not only are we putting it, we're creating it and setting it up as a one or two level T lift, we're taking it off of the main construct and thereby eliminating the transfer of loads from the, from the primary construct to the construct uh, supporting the, ped the pedicle subtraction osteotomy. And I think uh, that biomechanical uh, environment really allows a much higher level of fusion uh, than, than if, we, uh, if we don't do that. And you can see for this gentleman, I did do a, an A-LIF at L5-S1. We did this all in one day. He was delighted with the outcome uh, and uh, the fusion grade. I think if you look at the inner bodies uh, clearly, uh, to me, that looks like a solidly healed spine. This is a, a, another example, one of the earlier patients that I did with the quad rod construct I now use in, in almost every case. And again, this is a patient with good sagittal alignment, but mainly a stenosis problem and a fairly large curve uh, and a lot of back pain. And this is what the dual pelvic screws look like. I use the, 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 the main the screws that I attach to the main construct are put in through the Calcabash S2AI approach, the uh, sacro Ehler screw. I think all of us are familiar with that. That's something I've been using for years. And, and uh, I guess to call out the kind of uh, one of the things I try to teach our fellows uh, is how to develop a barometer for uh, what new technology and new techniques are going to be valuable to you. That was one the first time I saw it, I knew uh, that that was going to add value because it reduced the amount of exposure. And before that, I was using this traditional PSIS approach with two more incisions and offset connectors. And I think the S2AI has really uh, added value and, and I've been delighted with that approach. I don't use the, the full on um, uh, PSIS approach, uh, posterior superior iliac spine approach to the second screw. What I do from there is I come proximal and lateral from that S2AI exposure. I'm lateral to the SI joint, but I'm not fully up onto the um, PSIS. And uh, so you're kind of looking at the medial wall of the ilium, and I'm, I find I'm uh, able to uh, put a screw down within, within the tables of the iliac wing. And then that actually lines up nicely with the dual heads or the domino connectors, as you see in, in this radiograph. So uh, unfortunately, we are going to continue to have some patients that end up with uh, symptomatic rod fractures and that uh, do need revision surgery. I think um, many of us are familiar with getting a call from an emergency room with a patient with new onset back pain with 
a concern that this patient needs an urgent transfer and middle of the night kind of uh, revision. That is clearly not the case. By and large, these are stable, uh, at least intermediately stable in the sense that they uh, can continue to walk around, continue to da do daily activities, and can be optimized and scheduled uh, on an elective basis for revision of their uh, non-union. At this point, I always use a CAT scan to look for the levels of non-union. Uh, gas in the disc is one of the big, um, the big red flags for me, uh, but also you can typically see a clear non-union either in the disc space if there's been an inner body or uh, in the posterior column if it's exclusively a posterior column fusion. Um, the, I, I will use a bone scan if it remains undetermined to me. And, um, you, you know, the, these, if they're going to be a staged anterior posterior procedure, you can start in the back and in the back determine exactly what levels are not fused and then uh, perform a lifts or some form of uh, lateral inner body fusion at the unfused segments. Uh, so I, for, for me, I would typically do a trans uh, or a, now an O-lift type approach or an anterior to psoas approach, uh, at four five and above. I, I continue to do five one as an A-lift. Um, although I know there are a number of surgeons with experience, uh, doing a, um, a more of a lateral inner body at that location as well. I, I typically do not revise the entire construct, but will use outrigger fixation across several segments. And if, there, if, if we haven't been happy with the alignment, this is an opportunity to change the alignment for the patient in the direction uh, that they want. And I can think of one patient, a nurse, that really I overlord dose that had a very high pelvic incidence, and I matched her pelvic incidence. It turns, that, it turns out that patients with a 75 or 80 degree pelvic incidence don't need 75 or 80 degrees of lumbar lordosis. You can back that down probably 10 degrees in that setting, and we did that for her uh, at the time of a revision surgery for non-union. This is an example of a patient that I revised who came in with Parkinson's disease. Of course, that's also a risk factor. Movement disorder, probably also a risk factor for non-union. I think the numbers are hard to prove that with because it's so few of our patient population, but uh, you can see her deformity very profound, and uh, we had a, a nice initial result and then a fracture right at about one year postoperatively. You can see the rod fracture down uh, between L3, or sorry, L4 and L, or sorry, I guess it's L3 and L4, and um, uh, and she was quite painful and quite distraught. Uh, for those that are wondering, these were rib cradles that I used as kind of a soft landing. It's another form of tether, uh, and these actually worked very nicely. These are vectors attached to the main construct. We had uh, very few of these patients. In fact, I think I didn't have to revise any of them for PJF. Um, I've now gone to a spinous process tether, and I've talked about that in other settings. Uh, and I think that's been described by Chris Ames and Chris Shaffrey. That's at least where I first heard of that uh, technique, and I've really found that to be very effective. So this was her revision strategy, and you can see we did an, uh, an OLIF here. I guess it was at 4.5 was the level, of, that's what I was thinking, was the level of the non-union. And then uh, relatively short outriggers. I think I would probably add another level or two today. Uh, but this healed nicely. You can see that uh, the cage there appears to be fully uh, full of bone. And, and uh, uh, I believe she is solidly healed. I haven't seen her now in a couple of years. But, um, but I think she would have found me uh, had uh, she had continued problems. So in conclusion, I think rod fracture remains a significant concern. Implant strategies are changing. I think uh, I have not been a big adopter of cobalt chrome. I've found that I had a couple of patients come up with late infections around cobalt chrome, similar to what we used to see with stainless steel. And I, I've continued to, I also found it very stiff, at least in a 6.0 or 6.35 diameter rod, really extremely stiff in my operating room to bend. I know we're moving now towards uh, uh, pre-contoured rods, and I think that may change uh, what we want to use as materials. But definitely multiple rod constructs, high use of biologics, large volume of bone graft, and preoperative planning that allows us to get the alignment correct, particularly in the sagittal plane. And then I think we, uh, we increasingly understand that rod fracture usually, not always, but usually heralds a pseudarthrosis. Revision is non-emergent and really not even needed in patients that have limited symptoms, but those with symptoms uh, can be typically revised without removing prior implants. If our alignment is good to start or close to where we want it, we really don't need 
to do, uh, you know, large revision operations. Uh, still not, uh, you know, still nothing to uh, to uh, sniff at. It's it's still significant surgery, but I think we can typically get these patients back to their uh, initial post-operative um, uh, situation without uh, an enormous revision surgery. And with that, I'll say thank you and go cards. I'll call out the photo on the left is my son at the 2011 World Series. This is my brother and mother were with us. And uh, he was catching the ball tossed to him by Albert Pujols as Albert walked off the first base uh, with the third out in hand. And he actually threw it towards my son who was standing on his seat. And uh, a viewer, uh, you know, in front of us uh, reached up and grabbed it out of the air. And Pujols stopped on the top step of the dugout, pointed at my son and shook his hand. And this gentleman in front of us turned around. He said, oh, I'm so sorry. I guess this is yours. And that was the end result of the picture once my son had it in his hands. So go cards. And uh, I, uh, I'm missing MLB baseball. Go Major League Baseball. I was kind of curious when you were talking about some of the uh, constructs with the rod failure, if you think that they failed because of, you know, whatever issue in terms of your alignment or your fixation and the rod just happened to be what failed, like if they had received, you know, your current four rod construct or six O rods, if those patients would have then demonstrated ODIs like the other patients, or if you think they're going to have low ODIs for whatever reason or high ODIs rather, and the rod is just kind of a proxy for that patient and who they are and kind of how you feel about that with your current uh, philosophy for treating these. Well, that's a great question. And, and I don't know that I have the data to answer it right now. I think um, certainly, uh, you know, uh, I said that we wouldn't reoperate on a patient that had a rod fracture that was relatively asymptomatic. I'd say the converse is also true. So somebody who has persistent, severe back pain that you can't identify a, a cause for, uh, is also somebody that we're typically not going to propose further surgery, and at least not for a long while, right? So uh, you need to have the diagnosis and some sort of an idea of what's causing the pain in order to address it. And certainly there are patients who come in, you know, obviously it's a spectrum, and we all have patients who do very well, and we have patients who do less well. Uh, so I think, I think both are true. Um, and then if I could just ask one more thing real quick on the case example you gave with the fractured rod that you then did the anterior inner body, do you run into issues trying to get those in with, you know, when you're kind of distracting anteriorly, the rod ends butting up against each other, or is that not something that really happens? You know, I don't remember if I did the posterior first in her or second, um, but I will tell you, and I have this in other talks, I, I have a different approach, I think, than most most uh, uh, open surgeons. So historically, we always wanted to go anterior first in order to get deformity correction and loosen the spine. Uh, I have gone to a paradigm where I go posterior first, and I try to do posterior only. So if I can get X lifts, or sorry, if I can get T lifts and uh, you know satisfactory fixation and alignment from the back, I'm done. And then I stage this, the, if I don't, if I have levels that I want to come back and do either an A lift at 5-1 or uh, O lifts further up the spine, I will do that typically at four to six weeks. And, and I really like that approach. You know, the traditional approach, you've got the, the spine is not yet stabilized. So you've got your inner body devices in. Uh, you kind of are obligated to go back within the first week. And you've got a patient that, you know, may not be eating. They may not be getting out of bed. They may be soiling their sheets. I mean, you've got a little bit, I think, higher risk profile for that secondary, which is the bigger operation. The posterior is bigger. What I've found by doing, going in the back first, I've stabilized the spine. I'm comfortable waiting a few weeks. That allows them to get nutritionally replete, get their hematocrit levels back up a bit. And uh, it feels to me like it has reduced the complication rate for the overall uh, operation, uh, despite still using two stages. And st two-staged operations, we do know, have a higher complication rate, and it and it, it makes sense. It's two anesthetics and you know two recoveries, and and so I, I accept that two stage operations have higher complications, but I like the staging. And to answer your question, I find that despite you know really robust posterior uh, implants, you can still readily get an inner body spacer in, and I may have some that subside into the end plates, but I find that makes very little difference too, because again, you've got stabilization. In um, it really doesn't end up affecting alignment as far as I can tell. Excellent. Thank you.
Okay, I guess I'll move on uh, to the case presentations. Uh, I'm Rick Price, um, one of the new uh, spine fellows uh, at Swedish. I come from uh, WashU, where I was trained in the neurosurgery department. Uh, this is a patient of Dr. Hart's, uh, patient TJ. This was uh, done about six weeks ago. And it's a 48-year-old female with history of ankylizing spondylitis and terminal heart failure who presented to the hospital with one month of worsening bilateral thigh pain uh, radiating uh, from her back. And a CT uh, demonstrated a fracture at L4. She denies any uh, red flag symptoms, such as weakness, paresthesias, or bowel bladder dysfunction. Uh, the patient has a uh, considerable medical history, uh, but most pertinent to uh, this talk would be her ankylosis losing spondylitis, severe heart failure with an uh, ejection fraction of 19%, an AICD, uh, stroke, and obesity. And the patient's uh, currently on Plavix and a quarter of a pack per day smoker. On physical exam, the patient's actually neurologically intact. Um, and back up about three years ago, uh, Dr. Hart actually saw her in clinic in 2017 uh, for ankylizing spondylitis and uh, flat back. I was able to find these x-rays uh, uh, on the system, but no other imaging. And at this point, she presented with severe back pain and bilateral radiculopathy. Uh, however, she was a pack per day smoker with an EF of 19% and was deemed not a surgical candidate uh, and didn't proceed any care, but was actually uh, admitted to hospice uh, for her declining uh, heart disease. Uh, happily, though, she was discharged from hospice uh, as uh, her heart actually was uh, improved considerably. Uh, so these were the x-rays from uh, when she presented to the emergency department uh, several months ago. Uh, she had pretty uh, severe sagittal imbalance, as you can see, uh, with actually a negative uh, lumbar lordosis of about 10 degrees. Uh, CT spine is a, uh, CT of her lumbar and thoracic spine is obtained. It may be hard to see here, uh, but there is, oops, there's a fracture here at L4. Uh, and also you can see it's fused pretty much uh, every spinous process, except for maybe uh, L5-S1. These are the axial views of L3-4 and L4-5. MRI uh, demonstrates stenosis at those levels, as well as uh, some stenosis at T10-11. So at this point, uh, we discussed uh, with uh, the patient and her family several options. Uh, given her um, medical comorbidities, uh, we offered just to brace her for the pain. Uh, additionally, we could have done a small construct uh, posterior spinal fusion to treat uh, the pain from the fracture or do a large deformity correction. Uh, during her admission, uh, she was medically optimized and a repeat echo actually showed an ejection fraction of 40% and uh, her plavix was able to be discontinued. Uh, given this fact, uh, the patient elected for a large deformity correction. Uh, she was taken to the oper uh, operating room, um, placed on a Jackson table with uh, Gardner's Wells tongs did a hybrid operation with uh, percutaneous pedicle screws placed at T5 through 8 and L1 to 3. And then uh, did an open uh, surgery at uh, the lower lumbar region, placing screws at L4 to S1 and uh, uh, iliac screws. Uh, performed an L4-5 discectomy and then an L5-3 column osteotomy, as that seemed to be the level uh, that was not fused. However, uh, when attempting to place the inner body, uh, brisk bleeding uh, uh, was encountered and the case was uh, actually aborted uh, because it felt it was unsafe to proceed. So a temporary rod was placed. Uh, the patient was uh, resuscitated uh, in the ICU and remained intubated, but then uh, was taken back to the OR three days later. Uh, at this point, uh, the rest of the procedure was able to be completed. Uh, they used a custom uh, hemiolium all uh, allograft inner body as long as compression along the L4-S1 to uh, close the osteotomy and did a T10-11 laminectomy. And this was uh, augmented uh, with BMP, osteostrand, and autograft. So this is the, the finished product. Uh, the sagittal balance was uh, corrected to SVA of six centimeters. Uh, lumbar lordosis, uh, she gained about 40 degrees from this procedure and put her back at 31 degrees. Uh, so this is again, uh, a uh, close-up of the full rod construct uh, and did it uh, with the whole procedure ended up doing a hybrid T5 to pelvis uh, quadra uh, posterior spinal fusion, an L5 uh, three-column osteotomy and a T10-11 uh, laminectomy. This here uh, compares the pre-op uh, spine parameters post-op and got a really good correction. Uh, she's now about six weeks post-op, uh, was discharged home, is doing very well. She was just seen in clinic this afternoon for a moon check. That's all I got. Is there any questions? Let's open this up for discussion. I have a question. Um, 
and I had to step away during your talk, but uh, did you say that in those patients that had sort of rod fractures and required revisions, did those patients have more stiffness? Right. So they, they perceived, even with a rod fracture, they, they, they certainly reported more pain. And, you know, the, the ones that were badly affected reported more pain, lower function. And they actually felt that they were affected by stiffness in a bigger way than p patients that were solidly fused. And so I was saying, you know, that's, that's counterintuitive. Uh, but I think what it, what it shows is that perceived stiffness relates to pain in, a, in, a, in many cases. And so patients that have marked back pain don't use the motion that's available to them and therefore feel stiff. I guess that's how I put it together. I, it, I don't know. It's, again, it's counterintuitive. But yeah, that's what our data showed. Got it. So I don't know if you can show the, those last films. I'll, I'll call out the two things. I now have gone to multiple dominoes. So if you saw her x-rays, what we did here was use percutaneous rods that we placed at, in two separate segments. So I, the instrumentation in the lumbar spine was placed separately from the instrumentation in the thoracic spine. Maybe a master of uh, minimal access surgery like uh, Jeff or Neil could have done that with a solid rod. But I uh, elected to use a pair of rods on both sides and then a domino at a thoracolumbar lumbar junction. And so we've got an inline domino and then we've also got outrigger rods around the dominoes. So you've got uh, sort of four points of connection um, and I also like inline dominoes that have at least two locking nuts on either side. So that's what we placed in her case. And I'd love to hear Neil's um, thoughts on this, but like the, the advent of like um, multiple rod constructs. First of all, I, I don't think you would be able to, I don't think I'd be able to do that last case that you just presented minimally invasive. I think it's, it's sort of beyond what MIS can, can achieve. But with that being said, I, I don't, I, I don't see a lot of MIS guys putting in multiple rods, like quad rods. Have, have you seen it, Neil? Well, Jeff, I'll tell you, for an ankylosing spondylitis, it's actually, it's, it's very attractive. So I do exactly what uh, Rob did. Do your PSO, put that short rod in, control your PSO, but the long rod can be perk. It's fused. Ankylosing spondylitis is completely fused. So you could poke, screw it, and thread your rods, satellite rods, and do a four-rod construct. So actually, to me, it's extremely amenable for perk, obviously not the... So all you'd open then, a land up opening is the PSO level. So maybe one up, one down, or maybe two up, two down. That area, you do your PSO, control it, do it well. Yeah, and then you don't have to open the whole spine, T2, to mm. this, just to put a rod in. And I think, I think that's what Bob did at the top of this construct. I think he did like perk screws, right? But I guess that was my question. How do you connect those two, two rods? But like you're saying, have a mid portion where you do the PSO that's kind of like mini open and then connect the rods at that point. Huh? You don't have to connect it. I actually don't connect the quad rod. Oh, you do I not? I the satellite rods. Mm -hmm. They stay separate. I mean, that I learned from Manish. I'll give Manish credit for that. You mm -hmm. just put that short rod to control the PSO and then you have the long rod that controls yep, yep. the whole spine. And I've got them connecting them. Well, maybe I don't know. Maybe I need to. But it, I just left the satellite. Yeah. But Bob, all of, all of your quad rods, you you connect that with the main construct, though, don't you? In not general always. terms. Not always. So around a PSO, I really like hat, leaving them as satellite rods. And I was saying that. And this lady, it's a little different because the sacrum is also there, and so the loading through the pelvis at the lower end, you know, maybe an issue. But I feel like we really then take the PSO off of the main construct and really create a fusion construct at the PSO that's really a one or two level T-lift and should have a very high level of, of fusion. And the other thing I'll point out, I, I, did, I did this basically exactly as Neil, you just outlined, but we also wanted to decompress that thoracal lumbar level. It was, it, it, we kind of flashed by it on the MRI, but it was stenotic and compressing the cord. So I opened it there and then that allowed me to use that level as a, a connection point between the upper and lower rods. That's right. No, I think that, that's just very, very elegant. It's neatly done. No question. And I think when you do that satellite quad construct, it actually reduces the bend on the longer rod. And the shorter rod gives you great control. And I think that's why we're seeing less fractures and less bend in the rod. Unlike when we did one rod for the PSO, we kinked the hell out of it. I think this is, this is a much better way to do it. It reduces that bend. 
Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Before we move on, I know some other people have uh, gone to that sort of hybrid open um, with perk screws at the top, especially for longer fusions. Um, just wondering if anybody else has had any experience with that, um, actually running those, uh, you know, as a single rod I've seen in a couple examples, um, just running them from the bottom where it's open up to the top where you can keep it closed and percutaneous. No, it's certainly an option. I know what you're talking about. People, as they have sort of transitioned into minimally invasive techniques, I think it's just an easier option for them. If you're used to doing open surgery, and it's good to see that people are transitioning into that, but uh, and I think that's fine. I mean, I think the more we can save the middle line, the better it's going to be. And hopefully someday we'll all get to doing everything in my ass. It should end up at some point. Cool. You, know, you. you know what you should do, um, like... Surgeons that do that approach should follow their incidence of adjacent level PJK, you know, because I, I would predict, I would suspect that the incidence would go down because I think that's what a lot of MIS guys experience. Like when you start doing percutaneous um, procedures and not violate the midline structures, the post tension band, you, you see a lot less adjacent level issues ar arising over time. I believe that's true, and, and uh, it certainly makes it certainly makes biologic sense. Uh, this case kind of illustrates everything that we've been talking about, and maybe introduces another uh, uh, concept to think about. But this is a 59-year-old female uh, who had progressive history of kyphosis and work, worsening myelopathy. Uh, she had severe neck pain, which radiated to her left shoulder. Uh, she complained of bilateral hand numbness, poor dexterity, low back pain, numbness in left leg and foot, so kind of all over type symptoms. Uh, her history, uh, I will just point out that she does not have Parkinson's, and that can kind of maybe give away what we're talking about, but uh, otherwise she was uh, relatively healthy. She didn't smoke, um, but she was very, very active, uh, which was uh, something you noted. She liked to walk, she liked to garden, uh, she's worked uh, in restaurants, a senior care center, so she is uh, extremely active uh, with her husband. Um, so these are her images, um, and you can see that uh, globally she is uh, unbalanced. <laughs> that's uh, to say the least. Uh, her thoracic kyphosis was somewhere around 65 degrees, and that's maybe undermeasured. Uh, incidence was around 63. Her lumbar lordosis somewhere around 33. So she has a pretty large mismatch. Um, coronally, she's not too bad, but she does have uh, a small curve of probably about 25 degrees down in the lower lumbar section. Uh, but she is. Uh, uh, just globally uh, kind of uh, unstable, and she is uh, severe kyphotic, uh, chin on chest deformity, um, severe kyphosis. Um, this is her MRI of her cervical spine. Uh, um, this is the only MRI image I have, uh, just in the interest of time, but also for discussion points. You can see that she has uh, rather severe um, stenosis around the C3-4 and 4-5 uh, uh, regions. Uh, she has some stenosis down lower as well, but it is a fairly pincer-type lesion uh, around C3-4-4-5. Um, if I, I, had, I didn't put these in, I wish I had, of, but uh, around 2018, uh, she had some x-rays, and she was, I would say, probably about 50 to 70 percent better in her alignment than she was uh, coming in now. Um, and so uh, there's some progressive uh, deformity that's happening, and the question being, is this uh, stenosis causing some downstream problems because it is so high? Um, so for her, uh, we talked about uh, several different procedures, but uh, we uh, landed on a basically three-stage procedure. The first stage uh, was going to be an anterior corpectomy at 3-4 with ACDF of 5 to 7, and then flip her over into a posterior cervical fusion from 2 to uh, C2 to T6. She underwent this in October and did uh, actually very well from it. Uh, you can see that the cement augmentation down lower uh, to prevent any uh, uh, distal junctional problems, as well as the, um, uh, the uh, around the screws uh, uh, distally. Uh, to kind of prevent anything there. Got a good decompression and held her in a fairly good alignment there. You can see obviously she still has the kyphosis down low but that hasn't been addressed. If we fast forward a little bit, um, we uh, 
have some follow-up pictures from a couple months later, and actually the far right picture was from around December, um, and she ended up fracturing around the T6 region. Um, and so uh, she was originally slotted, I think, to go a little bit later for her second stage, but went just a little bit earlier. She wasn't really having any symptoms other than pain from this um, as far as myelopathy or uh, thoracic myelopathy, but uh, it was elected to continue with the next stage of the procedure. And so the stage two is going to be uh, basically from thoracic six down to her pelvis fusion. She got smith Pete osteotomies planned uh, throughout her thoracic spine, a decompression down lower um, uh, through the lumbar spine as well. And you can see uh, the results of that uh, very uh, um, encouraging. She. Um, <laughs> Uh, was uh, connected into her uh, rods above. The T6 screws were taken out um, due to the fracture uh, that was decompressed. And then uh, smith Pete osteotomies, like I said, throughout the thoracic spine. Um, and then uh, was uh, uh, rods replaced then from uh, T6 to the pelvis. And she got a uh, essentially a quad rod construct, uh, what Dr. Hart was talking about before with the four pelvic screws. Um, and this um, uh, satellite rod basically from uh, T12, uh, I believe it is, all the way down to the pelvis. And she did extremely well from this surgery. Um, she did uh, spend some time in the hospital with us, but she uh, healed quite well from it. Um, and so then the third stage was planned, and that was to do uh, anterior lumbar interbody fusions at uh, f uh, four, five, and five, one, and then uh, lateral oblique uh, anterior to psoas basically at T1011. Um, and this is to provide her anterior column support uh, for her C2 to pelvis. And so uh, this was performed. Uh, she uh, did very well from this. You can see that the alignment had been maintained. The time frame from this was she in October had the original C2 to T6, then in December had the uh, um, T6 to pelvis, and then uh, about two and a half months later had the uh, anterior portion uh, done, and she did very well from this. Um, did well from surgery. Her neurologic symptoms essentially resolved after this. She's been ambulating now and has recovered very well and rehabbed very well. She's now ambulating without assist, performing her ADLs on her own, and is very happy. Um, and you can see the difference that uh, was made in her life and just her back um, and how her parameters uh, are now well within um, acceptable range, um, and uh, she's on to bigger and better things. Questions, comments? How did you guys decide on that upper level inner body? The, uh, I think it was T10, T11. Yeah, that was, so uh, it, it, it was visible on CT, but not on the post-operative films. But she, when we, you know, I used kind of a cantilever maneuver to correct through the uh, posterior column osteotomies, and she sprung that disc open, sort of fractured that disc. Gotcha. And so I wanted to enter a column support there. That wasn't planned until after the second stage. Great. That, that, that was, that was very elegant, Bob. I mean, the, the only comment of any is I think I see you always connect the rods when you cross junctions. And I think that's critical. And I can, I can share one with you. We had a Harrington rod a long time, 30 years ago, down to L2. And then we went on and did a T10 to pelvis. But because I couldn't get my screws around, we cut the Harrington rod. And right. as stupid as I am, I cut the Harrington rod at T9. She fractured about T10 through her old posterior fusion mass, fractured yeah. right through it. And you never think that would happen, a 30-year fusion mass. And it's something I learned, I never let the rods overlap, always. And I, I don't even know what I was thinking that day. It went right through. That was a really good lesson. You let the rods always overlap or connect them or... And I see you do that. I think that's 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 a really good thing to do. And uh, now I could have weakened the fusion mass taking that Arlington rod out, and I think that's what kind of happened. And she literally fractured within six weeks. Right about the fusion, right about instrumentation. So these rods are important. They're really important. I've seen that happen when rods taken out too. People prematurely take a rod out. I mean, we say five years, six years. I just never take those rods out. They you need right. they fracture through the fusion mass. Right. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't agree more. And, you know, my grandfather used to say experience is a great teacher, but the tuition is high. And, uh, you know, we've all had and certainly I've had comparable uh, experiences. And that's what's led me to just making sure I, I for long constructs, I will take out in some cases part of one rod or even one side. I, I remember one 
that seemed to have an infection. You know, it was one of the cobalt rods that seemed to have an infection only on one side, really. And rather than re-instrument, I just took out that side. It was solidly healed and left one side in. So I will do that. But I, I always want spanning hardware uh, across the entire fusion mass. Yeah. In general, do you prefer side-to-side -side connectors rather than end-to-end, -end, if given the choice? Um, I use a combination. It kind of depends where things are lining up. And, you know, increasingly, I mean, I, I, actually, I think I, I feel like the side-to-side -side are mechanically probably superior. But you see, I always use two per side of those. And if I use end-to-end, -end, I augment with a with a, an auxiliary rod around that that is fixed in offset connectors. So, um, I you know, I, I'm also, again, in, based on experience, uh, not only do I want connectors, but I want multiple connectors at, the, at any junction. But uh, it's amazing how good these connectors have become nowadays. I don't know in the past, the connectors are the weak link all the time. Now these connectors are amazing. They work. These dominoes work really well. It's yes. really changed things. All right, Lincoln, I think you're up. All righty. Well, thank you. Uh, my name is Lincoln Jimenez. I'll be presenting the last case. This is a case of 66-year-old female who presented with uh, severe symptoms of myelopathy involving gait, uh, upper extremity weakness, as well as urinary finger alterations. Uh, past medical history was not significant, just high blood pressure and dyslipidemia. Uh, she had a quite uh, significant history of spinal surgery, including lumbar uh, fusion in 2002, uh, laminectomy to, uh, and uh, T10 to pelvis fusion, due stenosis and uh, non-union in 2009. And uh, later on in 2018, she actually had um, uh, an extinction of her surgery as well as an egg lift, which I will pre present later on. Physical exam was really normal. Uh, this is uh, uh, the picture for which she was operated um, in, let's see if, uh, I, I guess I don't have control of, of this, um, uh, for which she was operated in uh, 2018. Uh, she, uh, as I said before, she did, she had redo laminectomy uh, and decompression at L4 uh, through L1, as well as uh, T7 to 9, and replacement of the prior T10 pelvis hardware. Um, other than that, uh, the patient um, was actually doing well after the surgery. However. Uh, uh, with time, as I said before, she had an A-leaf. With time, she continued to uh, develop uh, pain, and uh, she actually was worsening on her myelopathic changes, particularly the uh, ambulation of this lady. This is the follow-up uh, uh, X-ray uh, in um, September 2018, and uh, later on in April, when she came back to the office, uh, she was noticed to have more kyphosis, and um, you know when compared, we noticed that uh, there was a um, an angle which was greater than 10. Um, unfortunately, of course, we cannot see uh, well here the measurements, um, but at that time we also did uh, because of her symptoms, we also did an MRI of the cervical spine, and we encountered that the patient also has severe stenosis at multiple level of the cervical spine, for which uh, at that time we decided to uh, propose to the lady not only um, uh, to do a spinal surgery, uh, a spinal cervical uh, surgery, but also to extend this to the uh, proximal segment of her thoracic, um, of her thoracic instrumentation. Um, so uh, the surgery that was done was uh, pretty much removal of the T T46 uh, instrumentation, and there was uh, laminectomies uh, from C3 to to T um, to C7, C2 to C, uh, C3 to to to, seven, to six. And uh, after the, that, uh, she had a posterior column osteotomies and uh, instrumentation uh, from C3, uh, C2 uh, to uh, two, um, uh, T6. Uh, the patient actually uh, did have, unfortunately, a little bit of a weakness on the left side. However, the patient has been recovered very well. 
her ambulation is actually improved uh, despite the fact that she has a little bit of weakness on the left side. And uh, her symptoms of back pain have also improved. Uh, this is the last picture that we have from her and all we have heard from her after you know, the, the COVID situation is that the patient has actually improved and uh, is uh, little, by, little by little improving her uh, clinical status. Now, if anyone has any uh, questions about this? I'm sorry to show two patients that have C2 to pelvis fusions. I, I certainly don't set out with that in mind. The, the one patient that we showed just before, I think is the only patient in my, in my entire 22 years doing this, that I went in with an initial plan that those it was going to have to be T C2 to the pelvis. This this gentleman I inherited, and, and um, he'd had a successful T4 to pelvis fusion, as you saw. And so with this myelopathy, and I, I think it was OPLL as well, uh, we didn't really see a CT scan, but mm -hmm. I didn't want to go in the front. And so I wanted a really robust posterior construct. So again, here, this is just kind of trying to illustrate the use of quad rods in cervical thoracic junction. And uh, she did come up with the C5 root palsy. That's what the left weakness was, uh, unfortunately. But, uh, uh, but uh, she's recovering from that and seems very happy so far. So hopefully, and I think we're about two months out, I want to say, on her at this yep. point. So Bob, this um, construct then, um, you, ex you went from C2 down and you connected it with end to end, right? And then, but then you put a quad rod there at the um, cervical thoracic junction just to supplement it, just to make sure because you knew that the forces would be greater at the junction. Then, is that yeah, correct? Yeah, exactly what I was talking about. You know, and, and the other point about this is you can fit a five five. I think that's a five five outrigger. I don't think it's six zero. Oh, so, but you can fit a five five, even a six zero oh rod up in cervical spine. We typically don't do it. You can't fit, you know, uh, screws with that sh with large shank. Uh, large shank screws, but you can certainly put uh, a large diameter rod and domino on to what you have there. So I, I think, you know, these are similar principles kind of extended to a different uh, area of anatomy. Uh, and, and I think quad rods and cervical and cervical thoracic spine, I think, are, are going to be uh, part of our armamentarium going forward as well. How about at the TL junction? Yeah, I, you know, it's a good question. So I, uh, I, I'm sure I would. I, uh, I'd have to see what the, what the indication was. If I, if I'm doing, for me, I have fairly standard stopping points. So if I have, if I think I can stop at a thoracal lumbar junction, and most of our work in adult deformity ends up with the pelvis, right? So the lower end, usually the pelvis, not always, but most often, and particularly in older patients. And then if I can stop at thoracal lumbar junction, I typically will stop at T10 unless there's a really degenerative disc, say at T910, or let's say there's a, you know, a few segment at T11, T10, I may stop at T11. Um, so I, uh, I, I will typically stop there. So if I stop at T10, my quad rods will end at T12 because I don't want to over stiffen the, the proximal junction. And I think most of the non-union that I'm fighting against is in the lumbar spine. So that's, that would be my typical quad rod construct there. If I go to T4, actually, I'm, I typically don't go a lot higher. I may go to a T10 with the quad rods um, just to kind of augment the fixation lower. But there again, I, I think we see very few non-unions in the thoracic region. Uh, and so I'm, I'm willing to go without. And, you know, we're not doing a lot of decompression there. Now, if I was doing, I could imagine a different scenario where maybe you're operating for myelopathy or a tumor or some other uh, indication where uh, you're going to have a shorter construct and maybe great instability at thoracal lumbar junction. And in that case, I would not hesitate to use shorter, you know, four, four rod constructs that don't go to the pelvis. Uh, so I, I don't know if that answers your question, but. It does. And, and Neil, this is what I was talking about. Like, I struggle with this because. I've done revisions, even my own, where I'm trying to connect it to the previous hardware, and like it's you can't do that percutaneously, like the dominoes. It's or if you oh, do, no, it's really hard. Oh no, 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 no way, no way, no, no. I completely agree. No, you'd still pass your rod, instrument, all that work, but at the site of the domino, no question, you got to open it up. Yeah. No question, you can open that area to domino it. Oh yeah. No, no way. I mean, that would be awesome. You could domino it percutaneously. I love that. <laughs> there, there isn't a percutaneous domino, though. That's the problem. No, I, I don't know that. No, no, I agree. No Somebody way. needs to develop one, right? There you go. 
There we go. Sounds like a fertile area for some IP, Jeff. There you go. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Fair enough. It's a good case. Oh, no, great case, man. These are tough cases. The only tough cases. Good job, bro. Well, thanks, everybody. Thanks to the fellows for the presentation. Like, you guys all did an excellent, an excellent job. And Nice work, guys. Thanks again to Ashley and Linda and Alexis for creating this platform for us. It's just so much fun and really enjoy spending a, spending an hour with friends. Yeah, it's thanks, wonderful. Bob, Bob, great cases. Thank everybody you, Everybody be safe. Be good. All right. Take, take, take care, care, everybody. We'll Bye. see you soon. Bye. Thank you so much. Have a good night. Stay safe. Thanks for watching. Hit the subscribe button for more medical content.